Well, thank you very much, John, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, and let me say on behalf of myself and uh, Maybrit Moser and Edvard Moser, how pleased and honored we are to, um, to be given this uh, honorary fellowship. I, um, I'll share my screen with you. Okay, great. Um, and what I thought I would uh, do in my, um, my uh, address this afternoon is um, give you some idea of how much uh, we have learned and uh, the community uh, which um, uh, Edvard and my Britain and myself represent, um, how much we've learned about the brain mechanisms involved in navigation. And what I'll tell you is um, that, um, can you see my cursor? Let me assume I, you can I see. Can't. Uh, yes, I can see. Yes. Okay, fine. It's, so what I'm going to tell you is that um, by concentrating on a part of the brain called the hippocampus, which is represented in the upper left screen here by um, a little seahorse, which is uh, the uh, meaning of hippocampus in, in Greek, um, we've uncovered many of the mechanisms um, and um, are beginning to be able to put together models of, of how the brain actually uh, underlies flexible navigation. And I want to emphasize this idea of flex flexible. Uh, so for example, we find in that uh, part of the brain many uh, cell types which look very much like spatial cell types. And I've put one of them on the lower left-hand side here, which is what we call a place cell, which tells um, the animal where it is in a particular environment. And we think if you take all of these different types of sp uh, spatial cells and put them together, you can create what we call a cognitive map shown on the upper right-hand uh, quadrant here, which essentially gives the animal, um, and we believe uh, human beings, um, a map of, of familiar environments with the location of landmarks in them. And also more importantly for this uh, talk, the, the, uh, the ability to move from any one location to any other location flexibly. Um, and not by just following a single route, by, uh, by making it possible to follow many different multiple routes. And we're beginning to get insights into how uh, this mechanism works. It's a vector-based uh, computational mechanism as shown on the lower right-hand side here. And I'll give you some uh, idea of how we think uh, that works. So let's just start briefly with a little of the anatomy of the hippocampus. Um, as shown on the uh, top two slides, um, the hippocampus, for example, on the right, um, is this um, small, um, sliver of a, a nucleus located inside the temporal lobes, as you can see in that uh, transparent skull, uh, or on the left-hand side in yellow here, uh, nestled right inside the temples. Um, if we look at where it is located in, in uh, an experimental animal such as a rash, we see on the lower um, left-hand side, uh, it has a similar shape, but it covers, it's, it's located in a slightly different uh, part of the brain. And if we take a, a small sliver of the hippocampus, uh, as shown in this aquamarine color here, what we see is this beautiful anatomical structure um, with lots of pyramidal-like cells uh, with their uh, processes extending all off in the same direction and gathering huge amounts of information uh, from uh, sensory uh, areas of the cortex um, and essentially having access to uh, huge amounts of information about the, um, the sensory uh, environment, the uh, external environment, but also importantly having information about the animal's own movements and uh, other aspects of its own uh, internal milieu. We, 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 um, we schematize uh, the uh, cross-section of the hippocampus as shown on the lower right here uh, and break it up into parts such as the uh, CA1 fields, uh, which is this uh, nicely colored field on the top here, uh, other CA fields, and ancillary parts, uh, which are equally important in terms of navigation, uh, the subiculum shown in the middle here, the entorhinal cortex, um, which the Moses are justly famous for uh, unraveling, and uh, other areas such as the subiculum. Our first clue um, as to uh, the role of the hippocampus in navigation uh, came from um, a, a simple study in which we implanted electrodes into the CA1 field and where we uh, allowed the animal to recover and recorded um, sitting outside of the cells extracellularly the action potentials from um, pyramidal cells in the CA1 field. 
And what we found, uh, we, 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 we placed the animal into very simple um, containers, such as this cylinder here. Uh, there's a polarizing card which tells us which way is north uh, to allow it to um, orient itself. We watch where the animal is with this overhead television camera, and we can tell where the animal is at any time, and also where it is when uh, one of the cells becomes active. And what we found um, is that the cells in this part of the hippocampal formation system um, actually represent locations in the environment. So as shown in the upper um, right-hand uh, uh, section here, uh, one of these cells might become active as shown by the heat map uh, with the red colors being the, the hottest activity uh, part of activity. Uh, when the animal is, for example, in this cell in the, uh, the, the southwest uh, qu uh, quadrant of, of the environment. And as I'll show you in a second, the cells, at least in this environment, um, were really interested in the animal's uh, location and not particularly the, the orientation that the animal had to, to the environment. And you can see this in the, um, in the uh, polar plot shown on the right-hand side here, where you see that um, it, it, it doesn't really matter too much which direction the animal is facing. That's not true in all circumstances, as I'll show you in, in a moment. If we look not at one cell, but of many cells at the same time, we see something very interesting. We see that the cells um, each represent a little patch of the environment in one of these small environments. We're talking about environments which are about a diameter of about one meter. Um, and, but each one represents a different patch of the environment. So if you look at this array of 32 cells here, each representing the activity of one cell, what you see is that uh, as the animal moves along, say, the top of this, uh, uh, this uh, square box, it moves from the activity pattern of one cell to another to another. And similarly, as it moves down along the uh, left-hand side of the box, so that regardless of where the animal is, there is always a cell representing its location. Interestingly enough, um, this mapping of the environment is not um, topographical uh, onto the surface of the hippocampus. So that cells which are very close together in the hippocampus, say these two cells, might represent very different locations in the environment, where cells which are far apart might represent a location similar to each other in the environment. Interestingly enough, if we take the same animal with the same group of cells and put it in a totally different environment, then the whole system remaps and we get a totally different pattern of activity across the same cells. And there are some new cells which begin to fire um, as well. Now, in an environment such as I just showed you, it turns out that the cell doesn't really care about the orientation of the animal. The cell is quite happy to fire if the animal is moving north or south or east or west. And that's shown in this left-hand plot here. If we look at the activity of this cell, which is um, slightly off center of this cylindrical environment, what we see is if the animal is moving north, you get the pattern shown at the top. If it's moving south, you get the pattern shown um, below it. And uh, similarly to the, um, to the uh, east and the west. So the, it's very clear that in environments such as the one I showed, and particularly if the animal is sampling the environment uh, without any particular goal in the environment, the cells seem to be um, omnidirectional and not particularly uh, polarized towards a particular direction. The situation changes and gives us some hint as to how the system might be uh, providing information that would be useful for navigation. If we change the environment from this cylinder where the animal is free to move in all directions to an uh, environment which has, say, two goals, and that's shown on the right-hand side of the uh, of the um, the picture here. And here's three cells. Um, they're also play cells. And they're showing you the activity as the animal runs from one end of this, um, uh, of this uh, runway to the other way end, um, and then back again. So on this graph, it shows he's running from uh, left to right. And from this graph, it's from um, right back to left. And he just keeps running back and forth between the two goals. But there are two goals. And what you see, and it's very clear, is that the cells only fire in one direction. So this cell's fire is he's running from left to right, but not from left to right. And this one fires in the opposite direction, from right to left. And not to... So 
there was a hint there that on situations in which the uh, environment has a single goal, the cells start to become polarized, interested in some directions and not others. Well, to summarize about um, 30 years uh, of work uh, or more in, in uh, many laboratories, including uh, the laboratory of the Moses and our own laboratory, um, we now know that there are many different spatial types of cells in the greater hippocampal formation. Uh, and that's not only in the, um, the hippocampus itself, um, shown by the CA3 uh, cells here, CA3 fields, excuse me, where we find the place cells, which I've already described, but also in terms of these other cell uh, uh, areas, the entorhinal cortex and the subiculum, which are into heavily interconnected anatomically with the hippocampus itself, sending information into the hippocampus and receiving information back from the hippocampus. So early in the 1980s, um, a man called Jim Ronk, working in New York, found that um, a type of cell, uh, which intriguingly was the obverse of the place cell, where the place cells are interested in where the animal is, but in these open field environments, don't care too much about uh, the animal's uh, heading direction. These head direction cells were happy to fire uh, all over the environment as shown by the heat map here, but were only uh, willing to fire if the animal was heading in a particular direction. Um, so in this case, uh, as shown by the polar plot here, the cell only fired when the animal was heading in the north, uh, northwest uh, direction. And other cells um, are, um, pol are actually um, specialized for different directions. Uh, so another cell might fire to the east and another to the south. And similar to the, um, to the place cells, if you add all these together, you get the impression that the, um, you have a system in the uh, hippocampal formation for providing something like a compass, uh, which tells the animal which direction it's firing as it turns around in the world. Another cell type was discovered by uh, my colleagues, the Mosers, um, in the uh, middle uh, 2000, uh, 2000s. And these are called grid cells, and they're found in this area called the entorhinal cortex here, which, as I say, is tightly connected to the hippocampus, projecting into it and receiving projections back from it. Unlike the place cells, which fire in one localized um, region of, of an environment, the grid cells um, essentially look like a whole series of, of place cells firing over uh, in many, many different places, but with this spectacularly regular um, symmetrical grid-like pattern, um, where each time the cell fires, as shown by these uh, bright colors here, um, it's at the point, the apex of a, 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 a say, a triangular structure, um, and where these... Uh, these peaks are actually located along trajectories uh, that related to the environment and which have equal spacing uh, between them. We also know that there are cells which represent um, vectors from particular objects in the environment, uh, perhaps the boundaries of the environment as, uh, as uh, in the case of these boundary vector cells. Uh, or in other more recently uh, discovered cells, object vector scales uh, discovered in the Moser lab, where um, the cell is uh, interested in how far away in a particular direction an animal is from either a boundary or an object. We also know, um, thanks to the work in the Moses lab, that there are cells which are um, uh, coding for speed and, and, and other aspects of, of, of movement. So if you look at the uh, panoply of, of spatial cells, you can imagine that we have cells which tell the animal where it is, the place cells. We have uh, cells which tell the animal the direction in which it's facing in an environment. We have the cells, um, the grid cells, which um, might be uh, telling the animal how far it is going in a particular direction. And we also have information about how far the animal is from objects and and uh, and, and uh, particular aspects of the environment, such as boundaries. So we have many of the aspects of, of uh, the types of information which could go to make up this, this cognitive map. The problem is, and um, it's what I'll address in the rest of my talk, is how do you put these things together 
in order to provide a navigational system. These cells will tell the animal where it is, the direction in which it's moving, but how did they uh, combine to provide something which would tell the animal how to go from one location in an environment to the other? And what I mean here is shown on, on, on both sides of this structure. On the left is a map of Bloomsbury in the um, 1830s, um, and uh, I'm pointing to uh, what was then University College London, or, or actually the original University of London, which consisted of one uh, small building uh, at the time. Um, and you can see from the map, uh, even in the 1830s, Russell Square was uh, well established, Bedford Square, uh, the, British, uh, the British Museum and British Library. And what we're interested in then is how can we take those spatial cells and combine them in a computational model, which will, uh, for example, show a person who's, um, or tell a person or inform a person who's at the uh, north east corner of, of Russell Square, um, the direction and distance, i.e. the vector, to get to the entrance to University College shown by this red dot here. Um, so what we want is a system which will provide that information in the form of uh, uh, this, this, um, this reddish purple vector here. But importantly, we also want the system to be able to tell us how to get there, given that, um, as, as is normally the case in, in built up in, in, in many environments, um, you can't go directly from uh, one location to the other because there are intervening buildings. So we want the system also to be able to tell us how to take, for example, the route um, uh, which takes it down to Gower Street uh, uh, to the left here, and then um, to make a right turn uh, to uh, follow up Gower Street to get to the entrance of the uh, thing. So we want something like a system which is shown on the right-hand side here. We want a system which um, takes the array of activity in the place cells, as shown by these uh, four by four arrays here, uh, representing a B and C locations where the um, the firing patterns at each location is signaled by the firing patterns in arrays, hundreds of thousands of these place cells, and where uh, if the animal is in one environment, uh, so in one location A, um, the pattern is different from uh, the activity in a different location. And we're not suggesting, for example, that these play cells are grandmother cells. We know that the same cells are, are active in different environments. So it's a pattern code, where it's the pattern across the activity of the cells which provides the information. But in addition to that, we want a system which um, not only locates the animal in different locations, but also um, locates those um, uh, locations, locates those places relative to each other, uh, which, in, as you can see from the left-hand thing, which provides uh, vectors, AC, AB, and CB, um, which take the animal from between those locations. And these vectors would provide information about the distance and direction within some framework um, to, um, from one uh, environment, uh, from in one environmental location to another. And of course, you can see why this, if it um, existed would provide an extremely powerful navigation system because not only would it tell the animal how to go from A uh, to C via vector AC, but if that route were blocked, how um, you could also take the um, the combined vectors AB uh, and CB and, and go from one location to the other by an indirect path. And that's what we think we have uncovered in some of our recent work, which I'll tell you about now. So in order to study navigation, excuse me, in, in, um, in an animal such as a rat, you need to do several things. You need to set up um, a, a, a maze-like um, environment. Um, you need to um, identify and designate one of the locations as a, as a goal. And then you need to start the animal from different locations um, and see if it can learn to get to that goal where, for example, it's rewarded with, um, with uh, food or in our case, um, uh, sweetened sweetened rice or uh, sweetened um, corn cornflakes. Um, and so, what we've hit upon of after many years um, is is a device where we can not only allow the animal to take the direct um, um, trajectory to the goal, 
um, as, as shown on the right-hand side, um, but, a, but where we can actually at any given point in the uh, trajectory present the animal with a small number of possible uh, uh, choices, say two choices in this case, um, which uh, sometimes, uh, one of which takes the animal in towards the goal, and sometimes uh, neither of them take the animal to the goal, and where he has to decide which is uh, the better choice. Um, let me let me show you a, a small video, um, which um, shows what this is. Here's the animal waiting on one of these uh, pedestals. There are 61 of these uh, pa pa platforms, and we can raise any one uh, of those uh, or lower any one of them independently. So the animal is now uh, waiting on a platform, and if it waits too long, we move the platform a little bit to uh, ask it to take the choice. When it makes its choice, um, it two of the platforms go down. It's then allowed to stand on the platform for a certain period of time, uh, investigating and looking in the different directions before two more platforms come up. Its job is to get to a platform in the northeast um, quadrant up here. Um, and as you can see, it does it by a series of choices. Importantly, uh, as I'll come back to this, when the animal is on the platform waiting for the two um, choice platforms to come up, it doesn't actually know which they will be. So at that point, it has to form a representation of the environment, which tells us the, val the value of different directions without knowing which uh, direction it's going to be asked to take. And you can see it goes through a series of, of, of choices until it uh, gets eventually to the goal. And it's only rewarded at the goal and only when it actually has uh, gotten to the goal. So um, now if we look at cells, these play cells in the, um, in the hippocampus while an animal is performing this task, uh, we say first of all that they are still play cells. They still fire as shown in this lower uh, left-hand um, uh, picture here. They still only fire in part of the environment, despite the fact that the animal has been in most of the environment. Um, and you can again see that it fires with uh, quite an, uh, an excited uh, pattern of activity in, in uh, this uh, um, area towards the east of the platform. If we look now in detail at what the cell is actually doing during one of these trajectories, and the trajectories are shown in the upper left here as these uh, white dots, dotted uh, trajectory lines here. But you can see that the cell doesn't fire all over the place. It only fires in certain locations. And as the animal goes from the start position here and goes through several of these um, uh, choice uh, choices, you see that it's only when the animal gets close to the goal, as shown in the upper right-hand uh, location here, that the cell begins to fire. But notice that when it fires, it doesn't fire in, in all of the uh, area here, even though the animal is turning around. It only fires in this little ox here. And you can see them better in the middle uh, bottom of, of, the, of, the, of the, uh, the picture here. And you can see it forms these scalloping uh, action potential patterns, whereas the animal move, turns around, uh, the cell will go blip, 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 and then stop as it continues to turn around. Here's another example. And again, you can see these scalloping fires. If we put all of these together, you can see that the activity is localized to a particular part of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, um, uh, the environment, but when it does fire, the cell seems to have a preferred direction of firing. We can represent that direction um, on each platform with a little uh, arrow, uh, uh, as it were a mini vector. And what you see is that as the animal moves around towards the goal, the uh, sum of all these vectors create a vector field which has a very clear orientation towards some aspect of the environment. Our first thought was that this is um, an orientation towards the goal, and you might think that in this particular cell, that's that's a pretty good description. But it turns out if you ask um, uh, and 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 uh, look throughout the whole of the environment and see what um, point in the environment is the best way of organizing that pattern of vectors, um, as shown in this slide, what you see is that um, there could be a point in front of the animal such that as the animal moves around uh, and changes slightly changes its orientation, uh, the orientation of these of those vectors is pointing towards this point in front of the animal, as shown by this uh, polar plot here, showing roughly zero degrees relative to the animal's own egocentric framework or its own body. But 
Equally well, you could have points, other points in the environment, such as this one off to the right-hand side here, whereas the animal moves uh, through uh, this arc here, this behavioral arc, it maintains a certain relationship to that point, i.e. it tries to keep it at about 90 degrees relative to its body axis. And when we used that kind of approach to look at these cells, what we find is that some of them uh, are oriented towards, um, the, uh, as the previous one was, towards um, uh, locations close to the maze, but others are oriented towards other uh, locations in the environment. So, for example, uh, the one shown on the left-hand side um, is oriented, as shown by this gray dot, to a point which is um, on the upper um, left-hand side of the, of the environment. Um, it still takes the animal, the, the vector field still looks as though it's taking the animal towards the goal. But this other one, another example here, um, it, the, the vector field is oriented towards this, um, this uh, point and what we call a con convergence sink uh, in the lower uh, left quadrant of the, of the maze. Um, and here what the animal is doing is actually orienting its firing, uh, and, and the, the cell is orienting its firing patterns relative to a point which is nowhere near the goal, which is up in this, uh, up in this upper uh, right-hand part of the maze. Um, so if we look at all of these locations for all of the cells in a particular animal, um, say this, um, this animal, um, so let's look at animal three here. We see that these convergence points, these convergence sinks are scattered all over the environment. Some of them are close to the goal and, uh, and, and, um, and would uh, benefit the animal to approach them. But there are many others which are not at the goal. However, we take the average of all of these convergence sinks, then we find that they, uh, they average to a point which is close to the, um, to the goal. Similarly, if we average the uh, the vector fields for all of these cells, um, as shown in the lower right hand side here for one animal, we find that they um, they all seem to converge to a point which is located reasonably close to the goal. Um, and importantly, if we take all of these vectors um, and look for their convergence points, we we find that they average to a, a, a convergent point which is actually in front of the animal. So by finding following this vector field, the animal could actually find its way uh, someplace pretty close to the goal. Now that's a useful navigational system um, for uh, a one particular goal in the environment. Um, if it's really a navigational system, of course, we would expect that if we change the location of the goal, what we'll find is that the low, the actual uh, orientation of the um, the these convergence sinks and also the vector fields would actually change uh, in line with that, and that's exactly what we find. So if we train the animal to one goal, uh, as shown in these top two uh, slides here. And then uh, look at the, say, the vector fields. We find that they're organized towards that goal. And then if we retrain the animal to a new goal in a different part of the, um, of the environment, as uh, shown in the bottom two um, uh, pictures here, once the animal has learned, what we find then is that for the, um, the hippocampal representation now uh, presents uh, both a consync pattern and uh, a set of vector fields a vector field which actually orients to the no, new goal. Um, so it looks as though at least one of the objectives of a navigational system is satisfied by this representation such that if you move the goal, the representation or reorients to, to find its way uh, to that new goal. System is even more sophisticated and somewhat more complicated um, because of course we want a navigation system which not only tells us um, as shown on the left here, how to go directly to um, to the uh, from one location to another, as shown by uh, this uh, vector from the um, from uh, Russell Square to the front of UCL by a path which is not in, uh, which is a bit indirect, but we really would like a, a system to tell us how good all the possible directions are. Uh, from the animal's uh, location or the human's location. Uh, again, going back to the vector representation on, on the right-hand side, we want to know not only the vectors A, C, A, B, and C, B, but all the, all the other possible vectors, such, such for example, um, is uh, the vector shown as A, D. 
because we want to have system be able to cope with situations in which the direct or indirect uh, preferred path um, um, is is blocked as shown by this blue block here and which would then be able to uh, uh, select other uh, possible directions of movement uh, and prioritize them in terms of how good they are in getting uh, the animal from uh, its present location to the goal and this is um, exactly what we find um, i've shown the vector fields as single vectors but in fact it turns out that any given location as you will have uh, noticed um, the cell not only fires in one uh, at one point um, with a uh, an orientation uh, but it fires in a whole series of, of of points here so instead of representing the vectors as single vectors with an orientation we can rec represent uh, the pattern of activity as a set of vectors, uh, which give us not a single vector for a particular location, but a whole uh, series of vectors. And when we do that um, and, and look at the, not the single vectors, but the, uh, the overall vector patterns, what we see is that uh, when an animal is at a particular location, um, the, uh, the cells not only tell the animal what the direction of the, uh, the goal is, but they also tell the animal the value of all the other possible directions that it could take. So they say that uh, the best direction would be the direction towards the goal, uh, but if you can't take that direction, then it would be better to take, for example, the directions um, at uh, 60 degrees to the goal, or uh, sorry, 45 degrees to the goal, and those would be better than the directions at uh, 90 degrees to the goal, and certainly better than the directions in, uh, in going in, uh, away from the goal. And when we actually look at those uh, new way of representing the vector fields, what we see is that's exactly what the overall population activity within the hippocampus does. It provides a set of vectors, um, which we call a fantail, which uh, evaluate the direction of all possible movements from any particular location on, that, um, on the honeycomb maze. So they tell the animal that it's better to go in the directions zero, and in this case, 30 degrees, then to 60 degrees and 90 degrees, and so on and so forth. So you get this nice fantail representation where the activity as the animal points in different directions, tell it the, um, the, how, how good the, um, the, the, that direction is in getting the animal towards the goal. And uh, there's a very nice uh, linear, pretty, um, it's monotonic uh, and maybe linear relationship between um, the, uh, the vectors in the directions to the goal, zero directions, uh, orthogonal to the goal, 90 degrees, and uh, going away from the degrees at one, 180. So I'm almost finished. Um, so what we think of the representation of the hippocampus um, as presenting to the rest of the brain is this idealized fantail field. So as the animal moves around in the environment in um, locations relative to this, um, this um, uh, hexagonal goal here, what you can see is that the fantails have a representation where the largest um, vector is pointing in that direction, um, but also represent all the other directions from the different locations. So here it's uh, the, the south is the best, uh, the strongest vector here, the north is the strongest vector, and so on and so forth. And we think that provides the animal with the information to make the choices on the honeycomb maze and actually in, in most circumstances. Um, I'm always finished. Um, if it's true that this vector representation and the fantail representation is actually providing the information which the rest of the brain uses, then we should see a difference in the fantails between correct uh, performance, correct choices, choices which are taking the animal in the right direction towards the goal and ones where it's making an error. And that's exactly what we see. If we look at the, um, the fantails at the point where the animal um, doesn't know what the choice is going to be, and you can see he's turning around, but he doesn't know what the choices are going to be. Or sub, just sli slightly after that, when he does know what the choices are going to be because the platforms are coming up, we see that in both cases, you get a proper fantail during correct choices, but a disorganized uh, fantail during the errors. And in fact, um, with the eye of the believer, it looks almost as though the uh, fantail has been, uh, as it were, rotated by, in this case, something like 120 degrees 
um, it seems to rotate a little bit back towards the correct direction uh, as the animal gets closer to making the choice. Interestingly as well, the uh, activity in the cells is, is lower, it's significantly lower, the firing rate is lower, um, which is of course independent from this, uh, this um, representation. So let me summarize then. Um, over the last uh, many 30, 40 years, um, in labs of uh, many uh, people studying this system, um, most notably the, the Moser labs and, and uh, of course our own lab, we've uh, come to the conclusion that the hippocampus is telling the animal a considerable amount about its spatial location, the location of other objects in an environment. And we think now in this work, uh, it's beginning to um, show us how it actually provides information about uh, how the, the animal can uh, orient to the goal and move to the goal by a direct path or by an indirect path. So let me summarize. The hippocampus identifies its, the animal's current location and what's in it. Of course, it's no good having a, a representation of a location if you don't know what's in it, and particularly whether it's a location which has a rewards or where uh, other things which you might want to avoid. And this is provides the information which is necessary to, uh, to f flexibly navigate. Um, when we look at the activity of these cells, and particularly the population activity, we see that the, um, the cells are uh, oriented in terms of specific uh, locations in the environment. They're spread around the environment and not just located at the, uh, the points of interest, uh, the, lo the goals, for example. We call these uh, areas, uh, these locations, consincs. And overall, um, this, the firing of the, the cells creates a vector field which points the animal in the direction of the, of the, uh, the goal. And of course, that changes when the goal changes. And if we look carefully at the detail activity uh, in each cell and, and in the population of cells, they represent something like a fantail, where they're not only telling how good the direction, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, particular direction to the goal is, but also other directions which the animal might be obliged to take if it can't go to the, directly to the goal. And um, at least so far, it looks as though these fantails uh, do predict how well the animal behaves on, 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 this, um, on this particular um, navigation task. So thank you for your attention. Um, I just want to um, recognize um, the, um, the funders. Um, uh, the Gatsby and the Welcome uh, Foundation have provided us with substantial funds over the years and have combined um, in the last uh, five or six years to provide a, a considerable amount of money to set up the and to build and, and uh, to establish the Sainsbury Welcome Center, which is dedicated to understanding the neural circuits, not only underlying navigation, but other cognitive processes such as motivation and, uh, and uh, cognition. And I've spent my whole in, entire life at uh, UCL, which has been very, uh, very good to me. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'm uh, happy to take questions.